Hey everyone, it's Natalie, and I just had a few quick updates before we get to the meat of the episode and all the tolerating that we do here on To All the Men I've Tolerated Before. So, I hope that you've heard that we have a Patreon, and now we have added a goal to get 25 Patreon members supporting the show. Once that happens, I have some cool perks planned out to release Spoiler alert, one of them is a pen pal program because I love mail and I love putting stickers on envelopes. So head to the link in the show notes, head to the Patreon and consider joining us and all the fun we could be having. Also, every Tuesday on Instagram Live at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, we are partnering with Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous to bring you Still Comfy with Jules and Nat. Uh, It's a show where we're looking at our comfort TV shows and movies to see if they still make us feel warm and gooey on the inside. So check it out. And I can't wait to see you, whether it's on Patreon, Instagram, or in the DMs. Love you all. Thanks for being here. Tolerators, this is To All the Men I've Tolerated Before with Natalie Katona, the show where my guest and I chat about the oppressive systems in our society that keep women from having money, even though they always have to worry about money. You'll recognize our guest, Trina, from our episode earlier this season about unemployment. Thanks for being back, Trina. Yay, thanks for having me back. Thank you for being willing to talk to us about women and our relationship to money and finances. Of course. That's one of my super like life purpose topics. You know, I went to school for finance and um, main reason for that is because I've always struggled with finance. So, yeah, you know, I just refuse to talk about it or my struggle. <laughs> I just go. I just Yeah. Like- and a lot of people are like that. <laughs> I just like to side eye money and be like, maybe if I don't make eye contact with you, you won't be a problem for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's the system for you. You know, like they, they, it, it, and it's like the work culture. Oh, you can't talk about your salary. Right. Don't talk about money. You know, it's very taboo. It's tacky to talk about money. You know, like that's definitely, that's the fear that I think a lot of people have is just, it doesn't feel natural, Mm -hmm. especially for women. Well, and then not only does it not feel natural to talk about money, but also because money lives, it's like sexuality because money lives in this mystery. You're like, well, I know that some people take existing money and they make it into more money. (laughs) I don't know how they do it. And they're not going to tell me because then there's less money for them to make into more money. (laughs) Well, I mean, for me, I think, you know, just being in the finance world, what I've kind of realized and, and through like listening to other people on podcasts and um, just kind of learning about it for myself, you know, it's not necessarily that it's a mystery. I mean, it's a mystery for women because we are not conditioned to, be a part of that world. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's a little bit different for boys and men. You know, I do think that just generally in our society, they are growing up in kind of that world and in kind of that mentality of like, oh, we're supposed to be the provider. So we have to figure out how we're going to do that. Whereas women are conditioned to be the caretakers, the nurturers, the ones that are like, you know, we don't, we're not conditioned to worry about that kind of thing. Or we're conditioned to work, worry about it when it comes to like running the household. It's like, well, you get to have an inside look into the finances because I need you to be in charge of the electric bill and making sure everything gets paid while I go out and make money. Yeah. And that's very, that's actually very common. I mean, like, you know, generally women do they're they're managing the household bills and things like that but like as far as 
growing money, Mm -hmm. that is very much typically looked at as a man's role. Yeah. In quotations, you know? Um, So yeah, there's still a lot of stigma around that. Yeah. So can you explain to the tolerators what made you called to help women understand money management and finances? Because I know that this is a very noble goal that you're trying to build a life around, but like what sold you on? Like, this is my purpose. This is what I need to be doing. Sure. So, um, and I think I did kind of touch upon this a little bit in our last conversation. Um, but uh, you know, definitely going in more detail right now. Um, so growing up, um, I, you know, we struggled a lot. My parents really struggled to maintain a job. And um, even though I wouldn't necessarily call us poor, I mean, we, we live, we, you know, they had houses, we were, you know, we had food and things like that, but it was just very unstable. And so growing up, there was just a lot that we didn't have. There was a lot that you know, it, and, and I think a lot of that, you know, getting older and just kind of analyzing and going back into that inner child work, um, realizing that how much mental health plays a part in financial stability. And, and that is another one that I'm very passionate about and, and working with mental, you know, mental illness and, and people who are struggling and to, to take care of their finances because finances is a part of self care and it's part of, of your basic needs. Um, and that's just, those are two areas where I've just always struggled. My family has always struggled. And I feel like I have a really compassionate and empathetic perspective on, on this topic and, and can really help people who are in a similar situation. That's so lovely. And especially like, Because I think another thing that no one ever wants to talk about is the mental and emotional toll it takes on a person to be in a place where they're in a scarcity mindset all the time. Yes. Yes. Whether or not I can provide for myself or whether or not I'm making more money to provide for myself or whatever, there's always like this ticking down of funding in my brain. And I have that scarcity mindset. And it keeps me from doing so much like trips. Mm -hmm. So I have the scarcity mindset when it comes to my own finances that keeps me in a constant, constant state of stress. And it's a direct result of this entire rhetoric that I've been sold about work, about our worth, about our productivity and the exhaustion that comes with prep over productivity trauma and how we always have to keep churning because at any moment the money could run out and then you're starving. Yeah, exactly. And that, that is exactly the, the mindset that, that I would say capitalism Mm -hmm. encourages. And I would also say the patriarchy encourages, you know, they want you to be scared. They want you to just maintain the status quo Mm -hmm. and, and not actually think outside the box for yourself of how, how do do you get, how do you get out of the rat race? You know? Yeah. It's definitely, it is a really difficult transition trying to go from that scarcity mindset to the abundance Mm -hmm. mindset of, of really truly believing that you are cared for and provided for and that you are always going to have enough. Right. And, and, you know, when you start talking about that, you know, I know when I've talked about that with people in my life, like people will literally call it, like, they will look at you like you're insane. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, they just do not understand or can't grasp the concept of, yeah, there's always going to be enough. You're always going to, you're always going to be able to figure out how to, how, how to get what you need. And Someone that I love very, very much. It was when I was having the meeting that would take us onto the live stream. And she was like, something that I just repeat to myself every time I think that I'm taking a step that would affect me monetarily or success wise or whatever. She goes, I just like sit there. And before it goes, I go, 
abundance and prosperity is mine. Everything is fine. And I think that is the exact opposite of like anything and everything that I've ever been taught because, and now I'm in this mode where I'm like, it'll all work out because I'm going to make it work out. And I don't have to play by the game that I need to live in fear because I'm working a toxic job. And they're like, but remember, you're so, 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 so lucky because I pay you mediocrely to be this stressed yeah. out. And, and we give you benefit. Oh, so you, you know, you're really making out. I have a conspiracy theory that there are no actual benefits because capitalism tells us how often in a year we're allowed to be sick, <laughs> how often. So like, think of the benefits that we get. So we're told how often in a year I'm allowed to be sick without consequences. Um, when I'm allowed to rest and step away from capitalism, there's also a time limit on that. Insurance. I mean, they ruined insurance as soon as I stepped out of college with these high deductible plans. It's barely a benefit anymore. Yeah. So if anything, this is my new conspiracy theory. I would rather step away from these quote unquote beneficial jobs with all of these benefits and be like, okay, well, what if I just had every day of my life where I could plan out? Today, I make this much money. Tomorrow, I get to work on this. And that'll lead to money down the road instead of having someone else structure it for me. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to sit here. Like, I, I do see the benefit to having a stable income. Mm -hmm. I also, I wouldn't necessarily say that having insurance is a bad thing because, right. I mean, Right now, I will say, like, I don't have insurance because I am working nonprofit and it's technically part time. So, you know, I don't have the luxury of having benefits. But at the same time, like, realizing that just because you don't have insurance doesn't mean that you don't have access to care. Mm -hmm. And a lot of a lot of healthcare networks nowadays do have financial assistance programs. There's a lot of resources out there that you can access to get the help that you need, even if you don't have the insurance mm -hmm. that, you know, pe that these co big corporations are saying, oh, you can't live without. Right. <clears throat> it's like, no, you you can live without it. I mean, we're, we're just taught and conditioned that it's, it, 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 you know, you have to have it. Mm -hmm. It, I mean, it's also interconnected and there's just like this giant web of oppression and misogyny that keeps us trapped, like we're a little spider <laughs> or a little fly in a spider web. And it's like, well, I need to sell you on benefits. So you work night and day for me, but I can only pay you this much because that's also bullshit. <laughs> and then the insurance companies need to sell you that that's okay because medicine in this country is just a pyramid scheme at this point like it's just like a huge it's money really terrible for... like prescriptions big pharma like it is disgusting yeah. like I don't I, yeah yeah and it's all just so interconnected and it does leave you in this sense of just like I'm hopeless all the time I have said out loud before and I've said it very recently it's like I've been on my own for 10 years I've lived away from my family for 10 years I have never had the luxury to take a step back, actually figure out what I want for my life and know that it was all going to be okay. And I've never mm -hmm. had the luxury to just like buy myself out of a bad situation. Even that phrase is so ugly. The fact that like, if I was ever in a bad situation, that the fact that the thing that keeps me from either continuing that bad situation or getting out of it is whether or not I can afford to buy myself out of it. Right. Right. And I mean, like I'm actually coming out of pretty much a, a six month hibernation yeah. where I'm just like, I literally like I quit my job because I was just so burnt out. And I mean, just constantly being pounded 
uh, and, and just trying so hard to prove myself in the finance world. And it just, it, it chewed me up and spit me out. And um, yeah, it, it has given, having this six months to just really focus on myself mm -hmm. has been life changing because even when I was going through college, you know, that's supposed to be the time where you do figure out who you are. But me going as a non-traditional student, I didn't have time. I was working three jobs and going to full and going to school full time on top of that, struggling with mental illness. Like it was just, I was, you know, bombarded. And then so going into a, a, a situation right after that with COVID and everything, I just, you know, it just, I just snapped. Well, and also like college being the time where it's like, well, get to know yourself. I was 22 and a moron. Like <laughs> yeah, fair. I was 19 Me years too. old and I didn't know fuck all about anything. I was a moron. Like, what was I supposed to discover about myself? when my brain was still mushy. <laughs> like, yeah. um, what does concise education about finances look like? And how do we seek out concrete tools that help with our finances? Well, I mean, I guess the first step to this process is it's uncomfortable. And I think a lot of people aren't going to like to hear it. But you know, you got to take your head out of the sand. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's just so many people who just don't want to deal with it, like you were saying earlier. And um, that really is the first step. <clears throat> and it's the hardest step. Because once you do get started, you can start getting yourself into a routine. I actually listened to a podcast called Financial Feminism. And um, that's run by Tori Dunlap. And I think she's awesome. Like she is just, this pioneer woman for women in finance. And um, so like, if you're looking for really good tips and just kind of a, a nice, fresh perspective on finance that isn't geared towards men, um, that's the one that I'm going to suggest you check out. Something that setting goals and, and just then taking a look at your finances, writing down, you know, how much do you owe? Where are, where's your money going from your checking account? Um, getting those basics down first is really important and having them written down, whether that's actually in a notebook or whether that's in an Excel sheet, just having somewhere where you can look and you can see what's going on mm -hmm. with your finances. Yeah. That's, you know, and that's, that's step one. And then what do you think besides it just being uncomfy. What do you think are the immediate mental blocks between a household with both adults sitting down and being like, we can do this? Well, I think debt mm -hmm. is a really big factor for why people don't do this. You know, they look at the fact that they're just in a hole and it's scary, you know, like it's like, you just feel trapped. Mm -hmm. But the reality is debt is not the be all end all of your finances. And it's not just because you're in debt doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that you're irresponsible with money. It just, it is what it is. And, and you know, that's, that's another one that I really had to work through of like debt. It doesn't mean bad. That mm -hmm. is just neutral. It's just, it is what it is. And if you can take the emotion out of the fact of like that scary emotion out of it and really look at it as a neutral, hey, these are just numbers. Mm -hmm. For me, that's what makes it easier to work with. Is it, it's just a number. I do like taking out the shame and the guilt that's associated with debt. Because if you think about the things that put us in debt, that are very common. It's things that everyone wants to do and helps make them successful. It's your student loans. That's a huge yeah. debt that everyone has. It's maybe the home that you live in, which I know that like right now the housing market is so volatile and millennials 
are all over the place saying that they'll never own homes because of all the debt that they're shackled with, or it's a car Mm -hmm. payment. I think sometimes we sell this perspective and I think it is truly to undermine women where it's like everyone's in credit card debt and it's because you wanted purses and it's like, no, I'm in debt because you refuse to educate me at a reasonable price. Right. I mean, like, and I was actually just talking about this at work today, like how, you know, I really feel strongly. What now? While I can't say that I'm a fan of the governor of Florida, (laughs) he did say something the other day that I noticed that I was like, you know what? He's making a point here. He was talking about how all, how it should be a requirement to go through a financial literacy course before you are able to graduate high school. And it's like, that's so common sense. Why is that not a thing? I have that on my outline because here's the thing. We had financial literacy classes at my high school. I believe they were electives and I believe that I took one, but I still at no point was it anything that was helpful or still relevant. So like they taught me how to balance a checkbook and I'm like, well, now the computer does that for me or they, Mm -hmm. or he taught me, he had this whole conspiracy theory about how buy one, get one deals were manipulation. And I was like, everything's manipulation. And he goes, and then I fought with them because I could. And I was like, I went to Claire's yesterday and I got two really cute headbands and they were buy one, get one. He goes, how much was one of those headbands? And I went $6. And he goes, you paid $3 for both of those headbands. And I was like, but tomorrow I could have paid 12. It's still a deal. I still have $9 in the green. So fuck you. (laughs) Yeah. The only thing that you do have to be careful about, and I will say this is you have to watch it because sometimes what they'll do is they will be sneaky and they will spike up the price. Mm. So that way you are, you're getting that buy one get one but really you're paying more than what you actually would for one on sale than if you were just buying it regular price at any other time so I know that like I've worked retail I know that that is something that like I I know like Old Navy did it did it I don't know if they still do I know Lane Bryant did it again I don't know if they still do but It's just, yeah, you do have to be careful because sometimes like they're corporate and they Mm -hmm. want, they're trying to make as much money as they can. When I worked at JCPenney's, it was when they switched their entire method to like, what did they call it? Transparency pricing, where it's like, instead Mm -hmm. of doing the Kohl's thing, where it's like, This water bottle is $40, but every day it's on sale for 40%. So you feel like you're getting a deal. JCPenney's was like, we'll do a couple big sales during the year. But besides that, we're literally just going to charge you what we can live off of and what you can pay. And there won't like this, this t-shirt will just be $15 because that's what the t-shirt should be. Yeah, but but I remember. I, I'm pretty sure I did a case study on that whole thing when I was in college and they got a lot of, of backlash. They for sure that. did. People hated it because I was in the, yeah. like, I was there and like, especially el- like old ladies, like elderly ladies would yeah. walk around and if go, they don't see that sale sign, man. Well, and they got rid of coupons and that sh- like tore everyone yes. up. Yeah. Like you, they just, like people, like they expect to see those signs. Mm-hmm. They want it. They want those coupons because it feels like they're getting a deal. Right. And we've been conditioned to think that like, we need to always be hustling for a deal. No one loved a JCPenney sale more than my grandma Peg. She had an entire mm-hmm. JCPenney's worth of clothing in her closet that didn't ever like cut the tags off of. Because she yeah. was a big clearance shopper. My grandma was like that too. Yeah. And she, <laughs> but, you know, I think that that, that goes into, that is a very female, that's a woman trait. We mm-hmm. are conditioned to bargain shop. Yeah. We are conditioned to save money for the household. Well, 
And I also think it's tied up in our worth in our household. It's like, well, I could buy this dress, but this dress is on sale. And who am I to buy a dress at full price? Like Exactly. Well, because our, our, our husbands mm-hmm. are, or whoever the breadwinner is, you know, they're working so hard to bring in this money. Who am I to spend that money? Right. You know, who am I to, to, to treat myself? Mm-hmm. I hear that mm-hmm. so many times from like, I was like, who are you? Who are you to treat yourself? I guess you're the mother of that idiot's kids. Like, <laughs> I guess, I mean, he could be paying a babysitter $22 an hour, but instead he's looking at you going, what do you mean you got the ice cream that you like today? Like, mm-mm, I'm not putting up with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. And my friend who's been on the podcast before, Stephanie, she always makes a really great point. So whenever you think about the distribution of labor in a household, the women's labor across the board is just not respected, nor is it ever lucrative. And then when she had her kids, she stepped away from the workforce and she went, think about the way that our country operates. That's five years that I have a gap in my resume, which means that I'm not on the up and up anymore of what is quote unquote work skills. She goes, that's also Mm -hmm. five years that I'm not contributing to my 401k. It's five years that I'm not making an income for anything that I want. So I am relying on someone to like, quote unquote, give me the things that I want. For one thing, it's very hard to be raising kids in this day of age and not have both parents working, but I still think we hold on to this mindset of, well, if anyone's going to dip out of the workforce and take a hit on their career, it'll be the mother. Yep, absolutely. And I actually was having a really awesome conversation with my best friend about this not too long ago because she is she's her her daughter is just about to turn two and uh she works from home she's she's been lucky enough that her her employer moved her to working from home and and it's going to be a permanent situation so um but she was talking about how you know the skills that she has gained as being a mother Mm -hmm. and how that translates to it's it's management skills it is you know that is, it's time management, it's stress management, it's, you know, it's leadership and guidance. So to me, I think that that's a really, that's a really great way that we can start trying to reframe women's minds and like, really, you know, apply that to work skills of like, hey, we may not have been making money on this, but these are skills that we have down pat because we've had no choice but to learn them. Well, and, and uh, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, like, to me, like, that's where, that's where I guess HR reps or recruiters, you know, they need to take, you know, it's not just about having that college degree. It's not just about having the work experience. It's life experience. Life experience matters too. Well, and so often your life experience really only matters if you met someone at a bar who was hiring and you could tell them your entire story. And then they like thought that you were charming and gave you a shot. Like, I would love it if women could put all of the skills that they've learned through just literally running their household on a resume as someone Mm -hmm. who isn't a mother, but also runs an entire project in this podcast that truly doesn't make me any substantial money to try and convince prospective employers that that is still worthy work and has provided me in or, or organic ways for me to learn skills on the spot. Yes. It's impossible. It's so, they just look at me. Like I'm sorry, but I really think I really believe that we need to start encouraging people to put parenthood on resumes. Mm-hmm. It's a real skill. And mothers should be allowed to say, "Hey, I'm a mom." And so I remember when you were applying for college, they wanted to make sure you were well-rounded for some reason. They were still going to take your bank money, but they wanted to make sure that you were a well-rounded person who had 
hobbies. So I think the skills that we naturally learn from the things that have nothing to do with money is also something that brings into the workforce a new level of thinking. Like artistic people can see the world in a completely different way than other people can. Absolutely. And motherhood is one of those things. It is near impossible. When I tell people that this podcast is actually my uh, life's greatest professional achievement and they just stare at me, I go, you don't know how, how I had to learn all of these things on my own. And I had to do it all on my merit and it's successful and it's getting me places. And they Yeah. And it's really one of those things where it's like, you don't have the support system, you know, you are doing this for yourself. And, you know, if no one else is holding you accountable, no one else is telling you to get up and, and do these things. Like you are learning these skills on your own. I mean, I know going through that process with Justin and learning, you know, watching him learn these skills and, and kind of having like a secondhand look and kind of being able to just watch him and picking up skills through that way. Like it is a lot of work. Like it's no, (laughs) it's no picnic, you know? I mean, yeah, there's fun aspects, but. This is Natalie Katona, host of the podcast to all the men I've tolerated before. Are you a business owner that would like to start advertising on podcasts and want to work one-on-one with the podcast host to craft the perfect message for your business on an episode? Well, you're in luck. I'm a one-woman operation and I have ad space open on future episodes of To All the Men I've Tolerated Before. If you are interested in learning more about booking an ad with our show, please email me at menivetoleratedbefore at gmail.com. Thanks, and I can't wait for our future collaborations. And I think the downfall when I'm in these interviews for jobs is I tell them, and I did it all while working full time, which I think signals to them where it's like she has priorities that are outside of her full time job. Like it's not like mm-hmm. a big aha moment where they're like, wow, she's so good at multitasking. She can do it all. Thank you, neurodivergency. It's literally right. like a, oh my gosh, she might prioritize something that won't make me money. Well, and yes, I 100% agree with that. And it's such a wrong mentality because here's the thing is that your podcasting, it's something that is bringing your life so much meaning and purpose and joy that keeps you going, Mm -hmm. you know? So in reality, you're being able to show up for them as your best self because you have this outlet that is giving you something that you can look forward to. And I just, you know, I do agree. Like, I think a lot of employers look at having these outside jobs or whatever it is that you're, that you're working on or these outside goals, like they do look at it as a risk. Mm -hmm. And as we know, since the beginning of pregnancy, employers have been all like, well, if I hire a lady and she's married, she'll one day start a family, which is why we had to make it illegal for you to ask people if they were married, because people were being prejudiced against women who may or may not be mothers one day. Yeah. And it's just like, I'm sorry, but why are we punishing women for being, for being mothers? Like, excuse me, like we were saying earlier, the skills that you learn from being a mom is so valuable. Like they need, like people need to start respecting that the, that it's, they just need to start respecting that. Like, and I don't know why my naive ass thought that like employers would respect my passions and my craft when they don't even respect the fact that people have children. Like I find the way that we do business and work life and all of it is nearly impossible for me to keep a life of one and a cat at like stable, but to be a woman who's making 75 cents on every dollar compared to the men in her building. And also having to be the person who's like, when soccer practice, did I wash those shorts? Um, do we have swim tonight after soccer practice? 
and keep that all in your head while knowing that at any moment a boss might be like, we're all working till nine o'clock tonight and you're going to have to be the one that dips because you have kids. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the system that we have in place right now, it's not, it is built for men, whether that was, whether that was intentional or not, I'm not going to sit here and say, but it's definitely, it's definitely geared towards men. Mm -hmm. And, you know, (sighs) I think that what you were saying about the, the, the pay gap, you know, being 75 cents, I think now it is a little bit higher. We are making progress there. However, you know, on, there are other stats of saying, so like there's a difference between the pay gap. There's a wealth gap. I think right now, um, the last thing that I saw on that was like, apparently it's 32 cents to the dollar. So for every dollar that a man is invest or has built up wealth, women have 32 cents. So there's just a really significant wealth gap. And it, that goes along with women not having enough education. They're afraid of the market. And I think a lot of, you know, a lot of people within the finance industry is going to say that women are more risk averse, which means they tend to step, shy away from taking any risks with their money. And I mean, to be honest, it makes sense because, you know, you, you're talking about a single, a single mother who's working two jobs. She's not going to take that risk to, to put money into somewhere that she could potentially lose money. Now, right now we're going in where we have a very volatile you know, it's all over the place and people are terrified, but at, generally I would say putting money into the stock market, if you're doing it on a long-term basis, you're not going to, you're going to see growth mm-hmm. versus losing money. Um, and so it is important to get, to have women start, start this process and really just find somebody that can guide them to make those decisions on how to start. And I think, so another thing that I remembered in a lot of marriages that I get to witness is, so let's say you are having the really tense money meeting. All of a sudden, the woman in the partnership is on the defense for every purchase she's made because men have this luxury Mm -hmm. of making money owning that money, using it however the fuck they want. But if you use their money to buy your kids a new summer wardrobe or um, decide that you're going on vacation or anything, all of a sudden it's frivolous. So I can't imagine how traumatic it is to be a woman who's trying to accumulate her own wealth when she's been conditioned to justify every purchase she's made. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I've also kind of come to the realization that I think women in general are just more goal oriented. Mm -hmm. You know, like we think we like to think about, Oh, we want to buy a house or, Oh, we want to buy this new car or, you know, we're not necessarily thinking of like the long-term growth of our wealth like that's not generally something that women tend to think about we're a little more short-term or you know like the 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 really tangible goals that we're looking to get so when you're when you're talking about teaching women how to invest that's really something that you need to be focusing on of like hey what what are your what are your goals and showing them hey if you invest this way you can get this in this amount of years and just making it very clear cut because i also have to see kind of the light at the end of the tunnel even when it's spending money on stuff like this i have to remind myself like okay buying a subscription but so I've started to think of everything as income. Like yesterday I got free lunch at work and I was like, I'm in the green today. <laughs> like I got free yes. food. I That's did absolutely awesome mindset. And so when so when I buy a subscription to something that's gonna piece out this uh 
podcast so I don't have to sit at the computer for a couple of hours and be like, and now we're going to post on Apple and now we're going to post on Spotify or whatever. That time is part of my income. Yes, you're talking about opportunity costs, girl. I <laughs> love it. And it's really helped my relationship with money because when you because money is something we made up. It's something we made up and we printed. People used to just barter time and goods <laughs> to one another. It used to be like <laughs> yeah. for a rack of lamb, I'll take the corn out of your fields or whatever. Like it used to work like that. But then we made money. And then everyone became so focused on money that we don't see how even the small investments that buy us back more time or um, help us out mentally or emotionally or like give us a deeper connection with people. Those are also investments that you made that yielded some sort of income towards you. Absolutely. It's benefiting you. You know, you're, 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 you may not be seeing that that rise in your money right away but like you're still it's a benefit and you're 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 seeing outcomes that you are working towards come to fruition as we know I get impatient so I also get short-sighted which is almost why it's almost better for me to be uninformed like if I was going to have if someone help me with like investments I would have been like never tell me anything about the number and we'll just figure it out when I'm ready to retire or an emergency happens because the ups and, and, the ups and downs of it all would make me more short-sighted. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And honestly, like, like on, on one hand, like when you're talking, like talking um, from like more of like an advisor perspective, somebody who is trusting and, and just saying, Hey, like, I don't really want to know play by play what's going on that, you know, that's get yourself a financial advisor. That's exactly what they do. Now for me, I, I want to be involved in that process for me personally. Like I I don't necessarily want to spend every single minute of every single day checking the stock market, but like when I also am not really interested in the whole short-term investing, which Mm -hmm. I think that that's really, you know, the whole pandemic and like the craze of investing, like that is really what that really did bring about that, that short-term investment craze of like, and constantly watching the market while there is benefit because you're learning and you're, and you're being able to see the patterns and analyze things overall, that's just a stressful way to invest. You know, it when you're so to me going for that more long term mindset, it does allow you to just kind of build the portfolio and then set specific times of like when are you going to check in on your money, Mm -hmm. whether that's monthly or semi annually. Like it's not something that you do have to constantly be checking. Yeah, and for me, that's just a less way less stressful approach to building wealth. Well, and again, the income of having a financial advisor is I get a little peace of mind out of that because I'm like, someone else is taking care of it and it's a professional. So I can just sleep at night. (laughs) And I do have a conspiracy theory on why they'll never make financial literacy a part of the common core curriculum. Um, It's the same reason why they don't let why they don't teach history from all angles or teach anyone how voting and elections work. And you just have to fucking figure it out on your own. Because if we're informed, we're harder to oppress. And then Caitlin, a couple of episodes ago, made a really good point during our single and thriving episode where she's like, if women feel continue to feel dependent on partners And they continue to believe that in order to be worthy as a woman, you have to be partnered, then they'll have lower expectations. So men just get to benefit from all angles because they're like, we'll never teach women about money and then they'll need my money and then we'll pay them, you know, 50 cents to every dollar. (laughs) And then, and it just all plays into the system where even if it's unintentional, which I don't think it is. (laughs) 
I've never thought that this was unintentional a day in my life. They end up on top and they end up with all of the benefits. And then they also get all of the control. Another, another thing that I did very much, and I saw firsthand working in the finance world of as much as you hate to make this stereotype, it is still very much a boys club. Mm -hmm. Like it very much is. And men are taught that this is a team sport. They're taught to network. They're taught to lean on each other and to build each other up. Whereas women, we very much have this mindset of every woman for themselves. Yeah. Strong, and independent woman. You have to, you have to prove yourself worthy mm-hmm. to be a part of that club. And if you are not on the top of your game, if you aren't just making sure that you have every I dotted and every T crossed, you're going to just, I mean, they're just going to annihilate you. I have a woman that I met through the live stream fireside show named Wendy Cooper. And she very much, she gave me a cool contact. She's like, I think you should meet with him. Talk about the creative process. Very approachable. Just give him a text message or an email sometime today. And I thanked her and talked about the reasons why I thought me and this guy could connect. And she said very plainly, she's like, do you see what happens when you ask for help and you ask people for their connections? And you're right. We're not taught to do that. We are just literally taught that we have to do it all. We can do it all and we'll do it all on our own. Yeah. Like that is just, that's a mindset that we as women are just conditioned and just drilled into our heads. Like, and that, and and that, that's where, you know, all this gossip and rumor mills and like, it's just so toxic because then you have these women who are also playing into that game Mm -hmm. and it's, you're, you know, you're just fighting against each other. Right. And I literally have to white knuckle down to ask anyone for help. And then another friend told me when I asked for some help to get myself out of a toxic situation, she went, why are you so ashamed that you had to ask for help? She goes, men ask for help with money and getting themselves out of anything and everything they've ever hated all the time. They do it without blinking. Yeah. But like for us, it's just, I mean, that the concept, because to be, let's be honest, the men are coming to us, asking us to do it. Mm -hmm. Like that's what's happening. So like, we're, you know, the idea of, of going to them and asking for help is like, that's just completely foreign. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm so glad that you made that point. Because I also think that women have been taught that if they outsource for help, that they themselves are a failure. I see this a lot with my friends who are mothers yeah. who also choose to have childcare when it's convenient for them. Then all of a sudden it's mm-hmm. like, I'm sorry, you didn't want to spend every moment with your child. <laughs> you wanted to do right? something for yourself. How frivolous and what a waste of everyone's time. Yep. Yep. Exactly. I also see it. So, okay. So let's be honest. I'm so I am okay at keeping this house livable and organized to a point where I can thrive in it. But have I ever scrubbed the baseboards? I'm sure I did once manically to make myself feel like I did a thing. Um, So when it comes to like that deep cleaning stuff, the stuff that I remember being done in my household in a moment of stress and everyone yelling and no one having a good time, I don't do it. I don't enjoy doing it. Same. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It brings back just terrible memories Mm -hmm. of the white glove going across and just and it's you know if if it's not done the exact right way you know and my robot vacuum is currently broken it was on my list to try and fix it today because I watched a couple of YouTube videos and I haven't yet and my and while I do have a regular vacuum I don't like how sweaty I get while I'm vacuuming it like ruins my whole day (laughs) So I like, I'll sweat at a Zumba or a pound class, like hot yoga. Okay. But like, if I have to sweat because I vacuumed, I'm done. 
So then the natural thought would be like, have you ever thought of outsourcing someone to do that deep cleaning of your home that you hate and getting back the gift of time? And it, and I went, no, I'm supposed to be taking care of this. Like the idea has just literally never crossed my mind. Right. Like I have been conditioned to do that job. Or Or I'm also so convinced that it's so expensive, even though I've never looked up any agency or private cleaning services, I'm so convinced that it is so expensive that because I'm not partnered, I can't afford it. And then that's another shame like moment where it's like, I can't even afford to help myself out. So I just avoid it. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So if anyone would like to pay for a year of deep cleaning for my house, I'd appreciate it. Recently, Mm -hmm. I have been told that I wasn't invited to go to something because people were like, well, the tickets were really expensive. And I was like, I would have sold plasma to go. Like, there's always money to be had. (laughs) Like, I would would have found a way. I would have gone bankrupt. It's fine. (laughs) Like, I... I would rather go to the thing than not go to the thing. So like I'll sell feet pics. I don't know. And (laughs) I think like another thing that plays into the way that we relate to money is it's almost this facade that we get to put on for people. So my whole thing with the housekeeper and like hiring someone just to help me out with the things that I don't want to do Is that the back of my mind, I also think that people will be like, well, does she think that she's Paris Hilton helping, getting someone to help her clean her house of one? Like, look who's so bougie today. Hey, well, you know what? I, um, you know, you had mentioned earlier about neurodivergency and I've been doing a lot of research on that. I'm, you know, really learning about and building some of my executive function skills and You know, that's just reality. There are more and more people every day who are being diagnosed with some kind of neurodivergent brain thing going on. And the reality is they're just not good at it. So then why not delegate to somebody who is specialized in that? And so that way they can just be, you know, they can focus on the things that they're good at. Right. That they can focus on their strengths and really actually be more productive in the long run. Well, and I think that's so important too, because one of my new mantras of the year is that I refuse to know how to do it all. So when the toilet broke and I had to call a plumber to fix the toilet, someone was like, you probably could have figured that out on YouTube. And I'm like, I don't want to know how to do everything. It's too much pressure. It's too much pressure to be a podcaster, a painter, and a plumber. Like, (laughs) that is a mindset that I still very much struggle with because I love the how to videos on YouTube. I love, there is a satisfaction that I get from being able to fix things Mm -hmm. on my own. But like you said, it does take away time from things that I you know, I would see as more productive and things that could, could be bringing me in income. Right. All right. Well, we are rounding up to that hour. So let's do our two traditions, which you've done before. What do you think as you've moved further into your education with financing and you've been trying to craft a way to help women connect better to their finances? What has your biggest lesson or a bit of knowledge that you could impart on the world would be? Learning and getting more comfortable about talking money. You know, that is such a important step to being able to take control Mm -hmm. of your finances. If you're scared, you're gonna, you're not going to do it. Yeah. And I would, so I'm going to extend, because you, you took mine. (laughs) I was like, mine's going to be like being honest and talking about money. And then you said it. So I'm also going to add on that part of being honest about our own money or other people's money is also being honest about the systems that are put into place that keep people away from their finances or away from learning finances or generating wealth in general, because 
it's all fine and well to just like accept that this is how our country is run. But if no one's talking about it, then how is anything going to change? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yep. What would be your manifestation moving forward for the collective energy? Setting healthy goals for your finances and, you know, checking in with yourself regularly to see where your progress is going with those goals. Yeah, I think my manifestation would be once I, I would just like myself to get out of a scarcity mindset. It's very, it's, and I would like it. I would like to get to the point where we're living in a world where you you know that if you got yourself in a bad situation, that there is a net to catch you. Because how many people Mm -hmm. are sitting right now in a bad situation and they're like, I don't have the money to leave. I don't have the money to quit. I like where do you go in a country that only values productivity and dollars? Yeah. Well, and that goes back to creating a plan for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that kind of ties back into the goals of like, you know, before you get into that crisis situation, have sit down with yourself, sit down with whether, whether you're single or whether you're in a partnership. Mm Mm-hmm sit down and create that plan yeah, and create those goals before, like when you're not in that crisis state. So that way, when you do get into a, a hard time or when you do get into a situation where you weren't expecting something, you don't have to stress. Yeah. All right. Make sure that the tolerators know anything and everything that you're up to, to plug and where they can find it. So I am... I am starting to do more and more with um, right now I'm on TikTok and Instagram on easy and awesome. That's easy. And the letter N awesome. Um, Right now I'm really focusing on um, like learning how to adult and just kind of learning more about ADHD Mm -hmm. and, and just kind of that world. But eventually it will kind of mold into more of some financial education and, and, and things like that. If people were, so this is mostly for me, (laughs) if people were following you at Unstable Unicorn, do we have to switch over to the new one or did you just change your account name? I do have two separate accounts. I still do have my Unstable Unicorn. That's more of my, that's where I definitely let out a little more of my, um, my emotions, you know, I'm a little more structured on my easy and awesome channel. All right. Sounds good. Well, tolerators, you heard at the top of the show about the new Patreon and how much it means to all of us when you choose any way to support this show. And sometimes that can be for free, but still makes me feel good. So it's income. And those free ways could be leaving us a five-star review and a comment about what you're enjoying on Apple Podcasts. You could always drop a comment on Instagram or on TikTok about what you're enjoying. Or if you have my number or you're in the Patreon, get a hold of me that way. Sometimes I just screenshot what people say and I post it as a review. (laughs) And then remember tolerators, you don't have to smile through anything you're tolerating, including the tight feeling that comes into your chest Every time you log in to check your bank account, because you have all of these un, what's the therapy term? Unresolved. (laughs) Unresolved issues from your childhood and the way that you were conditioned as a young adult about money. Smiles are for joy and someone will help you out with that. (laughs) 